Well, hello, folks. Welcome to three weeks. Yes, three weeks of programming about the Battle of the Bulge. Yes, I'm going to have a break for Christmas, but three weeks of shows coming at you. We're going into quite some detail over the course of those three weeks. The Lanzarath Ridge, we're talking about the Wereth 11 on Wednesday. But today, we're starting off with a good, solid overview about the planning, some of the things you should have known. Maybe you do know, maybe you don't know. We'll find out. And I have with me a guest who wrote probably the definitive, certainly the definitive recent book on the Ardennes, Snow and Steel. Um, definitive is a big word to use, but when you come to Dr. Peter Caddick Adams, it's kind of an appropriate word, and, and it's it sits on my shelf along with some of the other classic works over the years, but fantastic book. So we're going to talk about 10 things that you should know about the Battle of the Bulge, and when Peter sent through these things this afternoon, there were some I knew and some I kind of half remembered, and I did know that, but I've kind of forgotten and it'll be really cool. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce uh, Peter. So how are you today? Oh, hang on. Uh, yep, sorry. Lost your audio for a second. Hang on. There we go. Testing, I got you now. Yes, well, here I am yeah, in Croatia. So the weather is gorgeous, and it's about as unlike the Ardennes as it's possible to be. Well, that, interestingly, wasn't one of the points on your 10, but actually, you know, the images <laughs> I used for that promo video there, we think of the Battle of the Bowl just being snow, but actually it didn't start in the snow and it didn't end in the snow. But somehow that's where our visual idea of it sits, is with snow drifts and, and freezing fog, and, and it, it's, what we, it's what we know of. But as we will get into it, it didn't actually start in the snow. But anyway, was it that's before we get into my, the... That's my, that's my... Uh, uh, and then, of course, the weather is the decider um, of uh, of when and how it's launched, because the weather is Hitler's secret weapon, um, and that removes the threat of Allied air power. He's never recovered from the tales of how his troops in Normandy. Uh, the one antidote the Germans have is not the Luftwaffe, but the, the, the Allied weather. Um, so it's all going to hinge on weather reports from U-boats that are sent into the North, North Atlantic with instructions to send meteorological reports back. Um, uh, and we know that they're doing it, but we don't know why. Uh, and the moment they report a, a classic sort of North Atlantic poor weather storm that will take about 10 days to get to um, Central Europe, that's the key. That's when the whole thing is launched and they, the, the machine ticks into motion. Yeah, well, we are. We're just. We are. We, your audio is breaking up a little bit. So can we just try switching your camera off, and we'll try and bring it in later on. It might just help us with the audio. Sorry about okay. that. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's better. That's much better. So let's start with the uh, these facts there. So the first one, Peter, is um, when did the planning start? Now this is the one that I think really surprised me the most because we think of this as being a reaction to what the Allies are doing. But well, explain more. Um, essentially, Hitler has always wanted to go over to the offensive. Um, and astonishingly, if you look up in the OKW records, uh, there is an instruction to Yodel um, on the 31st of July. So still while the Normandy campaign is in progress, um, Hitler wants to go over to the offensive, uh, but out of the Siegfried line. In other words, he's already writing off Normandy. He's anticipating a retreat across France, uh, back as far as Belgium, Luxembourg. Um, and Yodel instructs the uh, OKW historian, who's um, a guy called Percy Schramm, um, odd Christian name for a German officer, but his father yeah. was a uh, professor of history, as he is. Um, and he's told to look out um, the model uh, and the template for 1940. In other words, the, the successful... Uh, invasion of the Ardennes uh, in May 1940 that was undertaken by Rommel. Um, and essentially part of the, because it was close to Rommel in those days, part of the, the fire, the spark, is to do a Rommel, but in, yeah. the, in December 1944. So, the, the, and there are various other reasons why he, he plunges into um, the enthusiasm of, of, of undertaking this attack. Um, I mean, I argue that it, it part, it's partly a reaction to the 20th of July. He's lost first. Um, he's uh, uh, he, he seemed to be losing his grip um, all through Germany, particularly with the German hierarchy. So he's imposing this 
um, where he's actually pretty much written the instructions himself and refuses to be moved in any way uh, as to the detail. Um, he's doing this to impose his will back in, uh, in the fatherland and to reassert his authority. Um, and certainly that's my contention. So this is this 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 is long in the planning, and this is what confounds a lot of um, historians. I think I was sort of one of the first to, to trace it back that far. It, but it's absolutely fascinating. Yeah, and it, I mean, I always refer to that uh, because I'm a Normandy guy, as you know, to the to the the Ardennes plan being a little bit like Operation Lutich here in Normandy. It's you know, it's a it's a cutting operation to kind of break Allied lines, and the objective is a port. But um, do, do you see any kind of correlation between Lutich and the Ardennes offensive? Well, I, I mean, the, I mean, the interesting thing is, I mean, Hitler is is you know awful tactically um, and and really amiss strategically. But occasionally he has some very good operational ideas, and and you know France the the, the uh, he backs and he which is, is exactly right. I mean, the only way you're going to be able to um, the, uh, the Germans is uh, in Normandy is to cut off that great big thrust. Um, and the one thing about the Ardennes plan, and I would argue it's you know in, in completely unrealistic with the objective of taking um, the port of Antwerp is absolutely right. Um, and, and I don't think the Allies, particularly Montgomery, it's quite evident that, you know, Mark, he goes to Mark Garden instead of seizing and controlling Antwerp. Antwerp is, is the key to the entire Allied logistics piece. Um, and without it, um, the Allies are going to have to go to truck everything from the, the channel ports and from Normandy. So if you can somehow immobilize Antwerp, and don't forget he's firing V2 rockets at Antwerp all the time, uh, and similarly at Brussels. But if you can somehow immobilize the uh, Allied logistics, you could really knock the Allied army in the reserves um, of ammunition and all the rest of it. So it's the right operation to go for. And here's really uh, you're, you're, uh, unfortunately you're, you're really breaking up now peter can you try going out and trying and trying entering again maybe that'll make a difference i'll, I'll okay. hold the fort till you come back right Yeah, we'll just try again, folks. Hopefully, Pete will leave and come back again, and maybe it'll work. Back, right? Yeah, it seems better now. All right, and I'll I'll speak a bit slower, so hopefully, try try switching the the mic the uh, camera off again, and we'll see how that goes. Okay. Sorry, we, we we get to miss out on your cravat, but yeah, let's, right. let's try. Well, here let's we try. are. And w what I was saying was that the operational objective of Antwerp w was absolutely right. It makes a lot of military sense, um, and that's the thing that teases on his generals um, and almost like the allies. So he he does have this much every now and again of military sense and logic that defeats him at the tactical level and defeats him at the strategic level. Yeah. And, th and this is this is that point of the war where, as you say, he's he's still got some grip of tactical awareness, but he's also kind of losing it because things are happening around him. And where are his generals with regards to supporting him on this? I mean, are they at the point where they are still prepared to stand up against to him or do they just sort of go along with everything I mean, Yodel, particularly to me, always strikes me as being a bit of a yes man. But, but generally, what's going on with high high command at this point, sort of late late forty four? Well, it, it's an interesting uh, freeze frame moment um, because, of course, the German high command is reeling from the um, and, and that means that they are um, unwilling to stand up to in any way. So when he says, my hands are this is what you must do, 
they really there are some half-hearted objections initially but they don't last um and they of course are faced with any expression of dissent is understood to be disloyalty by the nazi party and the ss um, and those generals who are picked to be involved in this all have to sign a piece of paper which will be if um, they fail to uh, carry out their orders and their family will go to a concentration camp, a medieval legal uh, term of called Sippenhaft. Um, so he's got them by the short and curly, whether they like it or not. Um, and they can't reasonably object because that that is taken as disloyalty rather than uh, constructive. Yeah, you're, you're, you're breaking up a bit there, but I think we'll, we'll keep on going for time being. So we've covered that it that the, the initial planning for this started as early as, as, as late July, which is astonishing, really. We'll move to the second fact. And the second fact, again, I was quite surprised about this because they're at the code name for the operation. Now, this is an incredibly important history, but it kind of is at the same time. So so there are three code names, effectively. The one we, we know, the one that it actually was, and the one Hitler changed it to at the last minute. So so run through the code names for us, please. Um, Hitler comes up with the original idea. The German staff are uh, popular details and they come up with their option which is called Christ Rose, Christmas Rose and that's the name the planning takes in uh, September and October that's changed to Watch on the Rhine, Wacht am Rhein, which is a very well known German patriotic song yeah. uh, and of course would persuade the Allies that this is an operation to defend the River Rhine, watch as in guard on the Rhine. Yeah. Um, but again, that change is because of Hitler's paranoia about disloyalty um, and operation. And then at the last minute, and we are talking a week beforehand, um, he changes the name to Herbsnebel Autumn Mist. Now, what's come through to us, most of the movies, most of the books talk about Wacht am Rhein. Um, but uh, technically, we should be talking about autumn, uh, autumn mist. And even that it is for all sorts of Wagnerian um, ideas. And, and I, I argue that actually, in Hitler's mind, this is a very Wagnerian kind of operation coming from the woods. Um, in, in the operas, Hitler would have said that mist is always when something unexpected and bad is about to happen so and he chooses these names too yeah good stuff well we're, we're breaking up a little bit but as far as i'm concerned we're understanding 99 percent of it so we'll, we'll keep on proceeding it's really good stuff so far um the next one we've talked about hitler um where was he because you know, there's all these various different headquarters that we know of, and we think very much about the Eagle's Nest that from the, from it being liberated at the end of the war, and we think of uh, um, the Wolf's Lair. But during the uh, the Ardennes offensive, he was somewhere else. So um, tell us where he was. He was at the centre of gravity of the operation. He's not in the He had especially constructed headquarters um it just underneath a castle in a little village called Siegenberg which is about 30 miles north of Frank uh, he's not that far 40 50 miles away uh, at most from the from where this battle is the bunker combat was put together for the uh, for operation sea lion um, it was never used, uh, and then it, it became a other thing. But he arrives there just before the operation on the 11th of December, and he spends the uh,
Yeah, you're, unfortunately, you're breaking up a lot now, Peter. We're we're back to square one, I think. Um, uh, let's. This is so frustrating, isn't it? You're here, I'm here. The audience is all here, and we're being we're being affected by gremlins again. Um, I might try cam turning my camera off as well. Yeah, that might work. Um, I'll just until he comes back, I'll turn my camera off as well. This is interesting, folks. These things happen. Um, we're doing our best to say, you know, Peter is in Croatia over the winter and it's not always a perfect connection. We'll try and we'll bring him back in and I'll turn my camera off as well. So, um, well, okay, uh, I've turned my camera off as well, Peter. That might help as well. Let's see how it goes. So try, try, try saying a phrase. Right. Um, uh, Adolf Hitler is in the eagle. His eagles have lost, but it's in. How's that? Am I coming through? Loud you got the, we got the beginning and we got the end, but the middle bit dropped out completely again. This is, this is such such a such a pain. Oh, um, I'm so sorry about this. Should no, we struggle on for a little fault. while? Yeah, well, see, when you said so sorry, that came through perfectly. Let's um, well, let, let's progress to the point four, and we'll, we'll keep on going. Um, which is the makeup of the German army, because this is going to be one of the, the part of several of your points here about the the desperation he's facing to get a, an offensive of this size together. So talk about the Volts Grenadiers. Oh. No, I'm sorry, Peter, you're, you're breaking up completely now. This is, um, this is not good. Hang on. Um, I'm not sure what we can do to try this, to change this. Um, Let's try, try, try something. Try saying it again, Peter. Okay, so Volksgrenadiers are the German infantry, uh, and they've been re. What I might try and do is try and. Phone. I wonder if I make a difference. Yeah, we're we're we're, we're still breaking up. Yeah. Well, I maybe suggest that Peter tries connecting via his phone. Maybe I don't know if he can do that Re or reboot the router. I'll just keep on talking for a second or two, and then we'll try and bring him back in. Tell you what I'll do, folks. I will just remind you that with this week of shows is being sponsored by Battle Maps US. So I'll just show you that brief little bit. It's only the 19 second promo, and then we'll come back and rethink. Bear with me. Here's a little promo for you. Well, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to send a message to Peter saying, try if you can try by a mobile hotspot, and we'll see we'll see if that can work. I'll just bear with me while I send him an email. Sorry, while I'm tapping a email, and then come back. But yeah, these are the things that are sent to try us. Um, it's Peter's in Croatia. He's had a few problems when he's joined the We Have Ways pod. It is how it goes. So we have got a spare day tomorrow. If things might be better tomorrow, we could try and do that, or maybe try and record it and show it as an as a uh, as a an uploaded one rather than live. We can do something. We'll we'll see what we can do. But um, hopefully he'll try coming back in, and we'll see if we can persevere with this. I'll just remind you while we're waiting for Peter to come back what we've got coming up. So I've got nothing tomorrow scheduled unless we end up rescheduling this show. And then from Wednesday onwards, it's seven continuous days of shows. So I'm working through the weekend. Then it's a break for Christmas. Then a couple of shows after Christmas. And then we're in another three in January. So here's Peter back again. How's that? Okay, so I can hear you well. Uh, how's this going? I'm using my this, phone. This, this is sounding much better. Well, let's let's persevere then. So um, brilliant. Um, so we were at Volks Grenadiers, Peter. So um, um I think we heard the fact that we're talking about a shortage of men, and I'll hand it back to you. Okay, so the Volksgrenadiers is the term for German infantry that came in uh, to use in the autumn of 1944. 
Um, and where do the Germans find the extra manpower to launch the Battle of the Bulge is really the question here. Um, and there are two aspects to that. The first is uh, a lot of new divisions are raised, uh, partly by shrinking the size of the existing ones. So you create more maneuver units and map pins. Um, the second is you find a lot of extra manpower. Um, Himmler is now in charge of the replacement army. That's the that's the body that von Stauffenberg was chief of staff of. Um, and he does that by, by um, uh, lowering the conscription age to 17, but also increasing it to 50 um, and drawing in reserved workers like people who worked on railways uh, or on the farms and also redirecting manpower uh, like sailors and airmen um, who hadn't got a job. Uh, and they were given often as little as three weeks combat training. Wow. But by pulling in all that extra manpower, they're able to raise several extra divisions, although we wouldn't call them divisions today. These were of perhaps a couple of regiments or brigades worth of troops, fewer artillery, mu much less right across the board. And what's interesting is that, that at this point of the war, the contrast with the Allies is that by... We, we, the Allies almost have too many people in the front line now. That's you know, the, the American divisions, particularly. We're taking out some of the veteran units that have been through from Normandy and putting in the new and newer units that have been coming ashore in the previous uh, you know weeks and months. And so there's almost too much manpower on the Allied side, and that the Germans are struggling, as you say, to even equip fully uh, fully their divisions. So when you're comparing these two armies as they were, kind of end of November, early December, that there's a that there's a disparity between what both sides are able to bring to the party at this time of the war. Yeah. I mean, we're comparing apples with pears really. Yeah. Um, and just looking at the map pins um, doesn't tell the full story. Uh, so that's, that, that's part of the problem. Um, uh, some of the Germans aren't even Germans, but they are, they're Volksdeutsche. So they come from Romania. They come from all sorts of places in the East. Um, uh, and uh, even the SS units now are drawing conscripts. So they're, they're far from the sort of fanatics um, of much earlier in the war. So the German army in a, in a snapshot is um, lots of smaller units, uh, under-equipped, woefully under-trained, and even, I mean, a lot of the units in the bulge are those who've been in Normandy, and very mm -hmm. few of them are in any equivalent state to how they'd been in the summer of 1944. So how do the Germans motivate an army that is made up of, as you say, young conscripts, old conscripts, foreigners, volunteers? I mean, it, it's a struggle then. I mean, what, what are they selling them this plan as? Is it going to end the war? Is it going to bring hope? Is it going to bring dignity back? How, how do you sell an army that's been on the back foot for the you know, best part of five months and tell them this is going to to, to be the you know, something worth committing to well i can answer that in 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 two ways one is of course hitler has got to sell it to his generals First, yeah. um and model himself agrees that it only has a 10 percent chance of success so if the guy at the top commanding uh, army group b uh, doesn't really feel it's going to achieve anything. Uh, Rundstedt, after the war, said if we'd ever reached the, the River Meuse, which, of course, most don't, we should have got down on our knees and prayed for, 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 um, for thankfulness. So if the guys at the top have such little faith in it, um, then, uh, then how do those further down? Um, and, and the answer is it's not sold to them uh, in the way that Hitler sells uh, the, the operational objective. Um, so seizing Antwerp in Hitler's mind will cause the Allies to blame each other, the British and the Americans, right. for letting this happen and therefore bring about a fracture of the coalition. And with the Allies in disarray in the West, he can then turn his attention to what's going on in the East. I mean, this is cloud cuckoo land. Yeah. So, you know, politically, he just doesn't accept the reality. But that's that's how he sells it to himself. And that's how he's selling it to his senior commanders further down. So the average Volksgrenadier walking into the forest is being told that there are so many extra troops, tanks and guns, um, plus the element of surprise that the Americans uh, and the British will be you know, wiped away. And 
they can see around them lots of new troops, lots of new. You know, mm. the, the guy in the picture there is holding a, um, a Sturmgewehr 44. You know, the, the forerunner of the AK-47. So new assault rifles. Um, I mean, this is the first time they're widely used. Yeah. Um, and a profusion of guns and, and, and equipment that a lot of people haven't seen in large numbers for, for you know a couple of years. The absence of Allied air overhead because of the appalling weather. Um, you know, some of them are really quite motivated to and believe that they could actually break through and end the war. And we'll come to this with some of your later points. It's the Germans are carefully managing the propaganda side of it by the what images they release, what they allow their troops to see. There's a they've got their new shiny things, as you can see there, the Sturmgeschütz 44 and the King Tiger up there in front at the front to kind of give their troops the idea there's this new technology, this new kit, because all soldiers like new kits, don't they? They all like the new shiny thing that's going to be better than anything else they've ever had. And so they're, they're selling that idea to them, I guess, as well, and then hiding, as we're going to get to it later on, the, the rear echelon side of things, which is hasn't been uh, modernized at all. But let's, let's move on. We already touched this a little bit about the, the commanders being brief, because you said at the beginning about the seeds of this as a plan go back to the summer of 1944. And yet we're talking about just days before they, they start, as you said, they're moving into the forest. Do they actually tell their commanders where they're going? And if we took, if we compare briefly to Operation Market Garden, a, a short, a, an operation planned quickly tends to have a poor, you know, maybe a poor chance of success. If you haven't had the time to really get to grips with it and explain it all to your, you know, your S2 and S3 and G2 and G, all those kind of staff people. So when were they briefed, the German commanders? Well, I mean, a, a good parallel might be Operation Overlord. So if you know you're going to land on, on the enemy shore and operational security is absolutely vital, you know, everyone at every level has got at least a couple of months of, yeah. of knowledge in order to prepare and rehearse. Um, and even those guys who, who you know, write down uh, in the trenches, um, they may not know the date and the time, but they know exactly what it is that they've got to do. Um, so Hitler's paranoia expresses itself in, in sus suspicion of everybody. Um, so no, everybody's going to be told at the last minute. So the commanders, we're talking core and divisional commanders here, are told in two conferences on the 11th and 12th of December what's about to take place. I mean, this is, you know, three, four days beforehand. It's absolutely absurd. But that that's it. A core commander not knowing that his men are about to march into battle just a few um, hours later. Um, the men are told the night before. Um, I mean, they've guessed it, probably. Yeah. Um, but, but the important thing is that the, the, you know, those at the operational level, the core and divisional commanders, can't really look at the plans, can't assess, and they can't go forward and do their own reconnaissance. Hitler forbids any senior commanders from going to the front line in case they're captured or in case some um, of a Stauffenberg um, mentality cross the lines and surrender and blow the gaff. Um, so, and, and so he does, just doesn't trust anyone. Um, now, now, von Mon Manteuffel, who's commanding the 5th Panzer Army, is told he can't go anywhere near the front and he he disobeys he puts on a colonel's uniform goes up to the front line with his binoculars and at least has a look at the ground um you see the germans don't even have any aerial photographs of, of, of recent note because they can't fly uh, because of the, the the allied control of the air yeah so they have very little knowledge no maps no no aerial recce very few prisoner interrogations um, to go on. So they're walking blindly into this attack. And that, that's really the drawback of, of the, um, the whole command team, never mind those further down the chain, being told so late. And Hitler just doesn't get it. And when we're talking about drawbacks, your next point, I've just put up the headline there, horses, because we, we just talked about it briefly, the images we have of the new kit, the King Tiger, we're going to come to Tigers in a minute, and the new types of rifle, and new this and new that. I mean, this is an astounding uh, mathematical detail that you provided this afternoon. So, so share it with the with the viewers. Okay, so so the Germans go into the Battle of the Bulge with fifty thousand horses, mostly towing artillery and other equipment as well. Uh, and we're familiar with perhaps the images of the German horses in the fellow's pocket. Yeah. Well, nothing has changed, and in fact, they're more reliant on horses 
in December 1944 because of fuel. They're, they're running out of fuel. But they've got plenty of horses and they've got plenty of fodder and hay to feed the horses. So 50,000 horses go in, in, into the bulge. Um, and and they you know they're, they're able to go off road in the way that most wheeled transport can't um, that the Germans have, um, and and as they initially take around about five hundred Panzers into the bulge, that's a hundred horses for each tank. Now in our mind, we've only ever seen newsreels of German armor in the Ardennes, and that's because the newsreels were very carefully controlled. Yeah, uh, and and so are the still camera images. And you and I, I think, we were we were looking for images of horses, and we've only ever found two. I've only ever found two of horses in the bulge. Um, uh, and and this first one, which able... came, this came yeah. from the museum in Luxembourg from their Facebook page, and and they aren't a hundred percent certain it's the Ardennes because it's kind of got an Eastern Front look about it. But the next mm, one mm. is absolutely certainly the Ardennes there. Um, and as you say, they were censoring, they weren't allowing their cameramen to take photos of the horses. There's no news reels of them. So today, here we are, 70 plus years later, and, and you can't find images, and yet 50,000 went into the battle. Now, what uh, it's been coming up in the um, in the sidebar that, of course, as you said, the horses don't need fuel, they don't they can go off road. They're not a complete limitation, but it does, it does give an idea of the German thrust as not being quite this technological. Um, wonder that, that the newsreels at the time tried to make it out to be. It's much more conventional in its in its in its operation. Yeah, so it 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 it's incredibly conventional in many ways. Um, in the the uh, the center of the bulge, the route um, the Fifth Panzer Army take is essentially the route that Rommel took in 1940. So that's a dead copy. Um, and this goes back to the point of, of looking out the plans in July 1944. Um, and because Hitler and Rommel were so close, it, it, this is very much Hitler driving this. Rommel, of course, is dead by now. Yeah. Um, but, but Hitler is saying, you know, we did so well, let's, let's do a, a Rommel again. Um, but he makes them cross that part of the, the front in two days, whereas Rommel took three. It's midwinter. And you can't go off road, whereas in the, in the in May 1940, Rommel could go off road, and the Germans controlled the skies. Whereas in 1944, the Allies control the skies. Um, so there are lots of differences, but it's it's very good to be able to compare and contrast the two German attacks four years sort of apart. Um, and of course, Rommel Rommel has you know there are horses in, in the Seventh Panzer Division, but very few, and they are all hidden in, in the same way. Um, so, I mean, it's it's quite a practical solution because the Germans, you know, they've got plenty of hay, hay. They've got plenty of leather for all the harnesses. Um, and Germany of many European nations has the least number of cars per head of population in 1939, 1940. In other words, very few Germans can drive. And that's still yeah. the case in 1944. Whereas many, many more understand horses because they've all come from the land. So this is playing to Germany's strengths. Uh, and we look back at, at, at the German army with its bicycles and its horses and think, how old fashioned. But in fact, you know, the, the Germans are making the most of the resources they've got and the capabilities of their soldiers. Very good point. Um, and talking about the, the, you know, obviously we're seeing photos of the, when the snow came several days into the battle. But, you know, you talked about the beginning, but when the signal was breaking up there a bit, one of the advantages the Allies have is we have a far better, more accurate, advanced weather warning system because we can forecast from that much, many different places around the world. Do the Germans, before they launch uh, this operation, have any idea that how bad the winter is going to get? Because... Various accounts say it was the worst winter of the 20th century. It was Whether it was the worst of the century, it was certainly a very, very bad one. Have they any idea of that? Okay, so two points. Um, one is the Allies have much better meteorological reporting. Um, and this is partly weather ships and weather stations in the North Atlantic um, and, and, you know, that sort of area. Um, and and the own, all their, the German weather ships have been captured, um, yeah. and it's up to a few U-boats reporting. Whereas the Allies have got dozens of weather ships. Um, we have meteorological flights that are going out every day from um, Scotland. Um, so we have a much better idea of the weather picture. 
Um, the other way is you, you look at weather by analog. In other words, you look at the reports from each and every year, you draw an average. Um, and that's partly what the Germans are doing as well. And, and the winter is much worse and is much colder. Um, but the, the other point to make um, is, is anyone who's been to the Grand Prix circuit in Luxembourg, which is at Spa, which is right in the middle of the Ardennes uh, battle area, will know that the, the, there's, um, there's highs and lows of ground, there's, there's steep valleys, deep valleys and high hills. Uh, and you can get brilliant sunshine one moment uh, and and pouring rain the next on that Grand Prix circuit alone. Now, translate that into 1944. So on the high ground, you can get snow. And on other places, you can, there's a complete absence of snow and the temperatures are much different. And the temperature range varies hugely. So it's not so much whether the Germans can anticipate the weather conditions. It's where they are and what the weather's doing at any one particular time there. And it mm. varies throughout the campaign. So it's not a case of, I mean, the, the Ardennes isn't completely covered with forest for a start. And that's our picture yeah. of it. There's wide open spaces. Um, but there's a lot of areas and a lot of times when there's no snow on the ground uh, and the temperature is above freezing. Uh, but generally, it's pretty nasty if you're there uh, out of doors. I mean, it, it, it's it's a bitter and cruel winter. And just like when we talk about shows, uh, you know, the, the theater of war in the jungles and the desert, it's a neutralizing environment. Neither side has any particular advantage or disadvantage. It's a, it's 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 both. It's bad for both, isn't it? You know, no, no army goes into that battle with the very best in the winter winter combat gear. Everybody's. Uh, equipment is not really suited for the temperatures and the conditions there. British Army, American Army, German Army. So it's essentially no one's got an advantage or disadvantage, really, I suppose. Well, both sides have got winter camouflage clothing, um, some of which have just been, you know, our sheets taken from houses. But but both of the both sides have assault troops which have sort of ski suits. Yeah. But effectively, I think our view of, of winter warfare is coloured by what troops are issued today. And this is yeah. the, um, uh, you know, this is the era before specialised winter clothing and all the warmth and everything else. Um, and and um, you, you're, you're in the world of leather boots that let the water in uh, and freeze. Uh, and if you're out of, out of doors for more than a couple of days in those conditions, you get trench foot. Um, and um, I mean, I had a look at some of the the medical reports of uh, some of the uh, the American troops, um, and they're losing a third of their strength just through respiratory problems, pneumonia and, and pleurisy and things like that. that. That's without anyone being shelled or wounded or shot at. Um, and the same would be exactly the, uh, uh, would would apply to the Germans in exactly the same way. Yeah, no, definitely. So let's move on to our next point. And we talked about it already, but the King Tiger, the Tiger II, because again, the images, even in my you know introduction to the show here, you know the, the German tigers rolling through the forests there. Again, the numbers don't really bear that out when you look at how many there were, and particularly the point you're going to make about the fact this is a new technology, well, fairly new. They're still ironing out problems with it. So, so explain why you wanted to bring to King Tigers as a as a point to discuss this evening. Well, let me take you back to 1970 um, and my Look and Learn magazine, um, which I, as a sort of nine or ten year old, would have been looking at, um, which had an article on the bold. Nobody thought tanks could operate in dense forest till the panzers came crashing through. And there was an artist's picture very like this. Um, uh, and uh, the article talked about brand new tanks unveiled for the first time. And I had visions of these, you know, just crunching through the forest blowing trees over um and to a certain extent that's upheld by the world's worst ever war movie uh, of 1965 battle of the bulge um tiger tanks had been encountered on the eastern front and were encountered in, in the closing moments of the battle of normandy so they're, yeah. they're they're nothing new um but they are an unproven technology in that they keep breaking down now a, a tiger tank really runs on three gallons to the mile whereas a sherman tank it, it is more like two miles to the gallon um so it's a huge disparity and of course the allies having a fuel efficient tank by comparison have also got endless amounts of fuel and the germans haven't um tiger twos weigh 70 tons 
uh, and you know anyone who has driven the Ardennes um, or has looked at the, the the images or the footage will know that you know it's it's pretty narrow winding roads going through inhospitable country uh, with lots of climbs and, and and falls. So you're using more fuel just to to grind yeah. your way uphill, and a, and a Tiger tank at seventy tons won't go over most of the bridges in the Ardennes. Uh, and it, to a certain extent, it is a race about bridges. Um, and, and so your routes are, are partly driven, governed by the roads and the bridge weights. Uh, and 70 tonnes is just too much for a lot of the bridges in and around the Ardennes. Um, Piper, also, Peter, sorry, sorry to interrupt you, yeah. but that, again, the Germans are doubling down, though, aren't they? Because we know even from the study of Normandy or Italy, for example, that using just Panthers and Tigers and Mark IVs, they've had problems of bridge weight and little stone bridges. And we can all give examples of, of crucial little bridges in Normandy. And other. So why are they doubling down with an even bigger tank? Where in the Ardennes, as you say, the, the hills, the valleys are that much more pronounced than in Normandy. They're, they're make, they've identified a problem in, in the summer of 44, and now they're kind of, as I say, doubling down on it and making it even worse. I mean, it, does this come back to the Panzer commanders not being bold enough to tell Hitler that this plan is essentially flawed and just going with it because they're scared? Um, there's an element of that and, and, you know, Hitler's willpower and insistence that he drive every aspect of this. I mean, Hitler doesn't really get the, the nuances of, of technology. He just likes bigger and better and more powerful. Um, so he, in, increasingly, he wants a heavier tank with a bigger gun and thicker armour. Um, and by really 1943, German armour development has abandoned the advance and has gone on to the defensive yeah. because the, the heavier tanks are all defensive in nature. Yeah. Um, if you look at the fuel tanks and the, and the fuel consumption, they're designed to travel shorter distances. Um, and, I mean, the, the story of German armour doesn't end with the King Tiger. I mean, there's this ridiculous thing called the Maus tank, yeah. um, which was even heavier. Um, and, you know, quite ludicrous proposition um, because you know, weight governs all sorts of things, breaks up roads. Uh, and the he of course, the heavier the armour, um, governed by the thickness of the armour plate you're driving around, the more strain you put on your gearbox. So you know, apart from fuel consumption, apart from bridges, apart from narrow roads in the Ardennes, um, you know, the big problem about the King Tiger is they break down. The, the technology hasn't quite ironed out all the problems but but the technology really argues against this platform because there's so much strain on the gearbox there's so little fuel and we are talking about the days now of synthetic fuel the germans yeah. are making fuel from coal and things like that so fuel quality is very poor uh, and the the armored divisions have another problem which is the crewmen have only brief training most of the most of the experienced panzermen have been killed in the yeah. east or in Normandy. So there, the new crewmen manning the panzer divisions maintain their tanks very poorly. And if that if that's the case, plus you've got poor quality fuel and terrain that really is against the tanks in the first place, you can see all the problems, particularly the heavier tanks, are going to hand, are, are going to have. So the Germans lose more tanks in the bulge through mechanical breakdown. Uh, than they do through combat. And the thing is, Peter, it's not just you as a historian saying this. This is being said by German commanders at the time. I mean, you reference Joachim P uh, Piper in, in your email to me. I mean, this is one of the guys who is leading one of the most significant and important thrusts, and he's commenting himself. I mean, what was he saying about the King Tiger, or what was he saying about the, the, the armoured thrust generally? Um, well, okay, so his boss, um, Sepp Dietrich, um, who's commander of the 6th SS Panzer Army, um, complained loudly that he was having to go down um, forest tracks you couldn't even ride a bicycle down yeah. uh, in the middle of winter. Um, and the whole plan was, was a non-starter to begin with. Um, Joachim Piper lamented the fact he had to take any King Tigers at all and insisted they go right at the back to the rear of his Panzer columns because of their problems because they were slow, prone to break down and so on. 
Um, and I met a an interviewed for the book, um, or, or before I wrote the book, uh, uh, a one of uh, Piper's Panzer commanders, Heinz Henniker, um, uh, who sort of repeated this and just sort of said, you know, one of the the, the problems was not just poor maintenance, but but brand new Panzermen who really didn't know what they were doing, and some weren't German. Um, he had in his uh, platoon um, some guys who had been transferred from the Luftwaffe, um, conscripts, uh, and uh, elsewhere in his battalion there were Romanians who were uh, German uh, Volksdeutsche. Uh, and a lot of these guys just didn't even speak good German. And, and the Luftwaffe guys just, just didn't understand ground combat. Um, and some of them were in tanks and armoured vehicles who, who just didn't understand how to manoeuvre them. So that, plus all the other mechanical problems, just gives you the most ghastly hodgepodge. Yeah, I mean, and I've driven a couple of armoured vehicles in my time, as you, as you have. And, you know, if you're an inexperienced driver and you're going on a slope and you miss a gear, either changing up or changing down, and you lose that momentum there, you're, you're kind of, you're stuck. And then you've got to build it all up, grind your way up through the gears again. And, and if there's enemy around there, anti-tank weapons or later in the bulge, allied aircraft around, you, you're on a hiding to nothing there, isn't it? You know, you'd want, for the conditions of the Ardennes, you'd want, You'd ideally want crews who know what they're doing with these things so they can use that terrain and or not be as put off by that terrain as a, as a, as a newbie would be. Well, I mean, this, this is the whole problem of using winter uh, as your way of grounding the Allied air forces um, because winter then plays against you and it worsens the, the terrain conditions. Um, so you're, you're operating in the Ardennes, which is probably the most difficult place to operate even in the summer. Um, but add snow, uh, and you, you you just magnify the issues, uh, you know, completely. Yeah. Uh, and again, this is what any commander could have told Hitler had he been willing to listen. But his ears yeah. are completely closed because he interprets any dissent uh, as disloyalty. Yeah. So we've talked about a couple of some of the things that were not good about the German plan. One of the things that could be argued was quite an in it certainly inventive and actually had some effect was this next point, number eight, Germans dressed as Americans. Now, some people know this already from the movie and, of course, they read your book, but this, is, is this a masterstroke? Is it, is it stupid? Where does it sit in the Peter Caddick Adams appraisal of, the, of this whole concept? And what was the concept? Well, I mean, if I look at another book I wrote, which was Montgomery and Rommel as Parallel Lives, um, the remarkable thing about the British in the Second World War is the amount of special forces type units that we develop. Um, and, and part of what they do is they dress up as as Germans, whether it's the SAS or the Long Range Desert Group or Popsky's Private Army, um, behind German lines. They look like Germans. Um that's how we we kidnap a German general on Crete, uh, yeah. General Kreiper. Um, throughout the war, the Germans never really go for special forces. There are a few Brandenburg uh, commandos who who um, invade Poland in 1939 dressed um, as Poles, but really they never get to grips with with special forces that are now you know routine in every army today, um, and that's a really really odd um, fact. Um, but you then interpret it in in 1944 by, by I mean, Hitler himself who comes up with this idea to Otto Skorzeny, who's come to Hitler's attention by rescuing Mussolini. And Hitler says, right, I've got you uh, here, uh, Major or Lieutenant Colonel, as he's about to become Skorzeny. Um, Hitler likes him because he's a fellow Austrian. Um, so th there's always a bit of that. Um and Hitler says, right, I want you to, to, to dress up in American uniforms and go behind the lines and sort of cause trouble. Um, and, and Hitler says, yeah, boss, you know, well, I'll, I'll do whatever's necessary. Um, and the odd thing is this has never really happened in the, in the German armed forces before. I mean, you know, given the opportunities, uh, it, it's, it's not an initiative the Wehrmacht or the SS uh, has undertaken. Now, it falls to Skorzeny, he's an SS man. And the real reason I suddenly realise why this hasn't happened is Hitler doesn't trust anyone. The moment you send G Germans behind the lines, they're going to surrender. Um, mm. And that's why in 1944, the reason why it's run by the SS 
is, is because they've got to be good Nazis and believe in the cause and not just volunteer for a mission, which gives them an opportunity to surrender. Um, now, the old thing is that, that what the Germans planned and what actually happened were two different things. Um, Scorzani never gets the number of American vehicles, the, the right number of uniforms, or the right number of English speakers um, in his unit, which is, is given a cover name of Panzer Brigade 105. Um, but the very few teams that do get through the lines cause such an upset uh, amongst the Allies, particularly the Americans, once they realize what's going on that there are layers of security that are imposed all through the Allies' yeah. um, sort of terrain, right back to, to Versailles in, in uh, outside Paris, uh, where the Allies are convinced that Scorzani is going to try and assassinate Eisenhower. So every headquarters is bogged down with security. Every checkpoint um, it is, uh, makes it very, very slow going to, for anyone to travel anywhere. Um, and all the official code names that you would normally have coming into play suddenly are out of the window because the allies think that the germans have got hundreds of, of perfect english speakers behind the lines they haven't they've only got a few um so it's no longer good enough to answer with a proper code name um you've uh, you've also got to understand who won the baseball league the previous exactly. year in america um david niven tells a lovely story he was a british liaison officer with phantom of, of being behind the lines uh, and being asked by an American um, uh, some detail about uh, about baseball. Uh, and Niven said, I really haven't the faintest idea, but I do know I made a wonderful picture with Ginger Rogers just before all of this came. Oh, David, oh, we love you. This is wonderful. Mm. Um, so there, are, there were ways uh, you could get around this. Um, Montgomery uh, apparently was told in his staff car, um, his driver was told to stop. Um, uh, and Montgomery said, no, no, it was a stupid drive on. Uh, and his tyres were shot out, which Bradley thought was absolutely hilarious. Um, but I think, you know, the counter of that is is a lot of these German teams, when they were discovered, were shot uh, as spies. Um, but more importantly, any American who wasn't quick enough off the draw in terms of answering a question, and we've got a lot of first-generation uh, Europeans in the US Army at this yeah. stage. There's a Norwegian battalion. Um, there are lots of Germans um, who, who've joined, who've become naturalized and joined the U.S. Army. Henry Kissinger, listen to him. He still speaks with a heavy German, yeah, German accent. accent. Yeah. So we think that round about five, 10 to 15 percent of American casualties in the bulge were friendly fire for exactly this reason. Um, and I mean, there's no way of sort of exactly checking that, but that you know, the the the, the sort of anecdotes that come up of, of uh, people who are caught wearing, you know, an American greatcoat with a German uniform underneath. Um, well, that could be a soldier simply trying to sort of get himself warm, um, yeah. or uh, you know, or, or Americans wearing German boots, which you know sometimes were perceived as warmer than uh, than their own issue. Kit. Both sides bo borrowed and stole each other's kit, whichever was warmer, whichever was drier. Um, so, and if it, your accent wasn't quite good enough, then you were likely to be shot. And, it, and so, it, it, you know, it, essentially what we're saying is the paranoia about this event was actually far more dangerous than the actual commando act itself. It was the fact that within the whole of the American army and indeed the British army, everyone's now paranoid that every, every guy you don't recognize who's got a bit of German kit on, whose accent is a bit funny, is a potential enemy. And that for incapacitates the, the, the ability of the army to function and if that's the case is that maybe because we now have as we established uh, there are these units coming on the line in the american sector who haven't been in combat before they're straight off the boat and perhaps some of the veteran units who'd been through normandy or been through the other they may be a bit more kind of game savvy and would have seen through some of the bullshit because you know, gis who'd been through normandy like tommies who'd been through normandy they knew that the enemy were capable of 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 trickery in certain cases, you know, turning signs around, and maybe they'd have seen through some of this stuff better. And these new guys were just a little bit, a little bit green around, the, and 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 missed some of it. Is that fair to say? Um, well, um, I mean, I, okay. So what we haven't done is have a have a look at the dispositions of the American units. Um, well, well we're doing that next time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's eight corps who are facing the the the, the Germans. 
Um, and in there are two units that have just not um, appeared in, in Europe before in combat. Um, the 99th Division, the so-called the Battle Babes, because they literally haven't seen any sort of combat. They, they're taking over their positions as the bulge begins. Uh, and then uh, the Golden Lions Division are even fresher. Yeah. Uh, and both are, are caught um, completely new to this. Um, and, you know, their dispositions are faulty and both take very, very heavy casualties. They both, in interestingly, um, my, my next book is is about the last hundred days of World War II. They both, interestingly, bounce back and do extremely well mm. in the last hundred days. Um, but, you know, their, their, um, their blooding in the Ardennes is... You, you know they they they're up there losing a third to two thirds casualties of the entire division, uh, and it's a really really rough ride for them. So yeah, I mean there's a, there's a lot of naivety, um, uh, lack of lack of you know proper drills um, that catch a lot of the Americans by surprise. So it's not it's not just intelligence problems of of lack of expectation. Um, it, it, it's also the fact that some of these are units that are fresh to combat. Which, when you juxtapose that with the Germans, you know, you've, you've got both sides. You've got a lot of um, newbies who are young, who are greenhorn, uh, and uh, combat is a, is a real shocker for, for, for both sides. But this brings us to our last couple of points, which are about, the, you know, the, the Allied reaction, because we've talked about the fact that Germans are using horses, that, that, that the commanders haven't got much faith in the plan. It's, it's, there's zero reconnaissance, virtually no aerial photos, three days of planning, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And yet it does catch the Allies by surprise, at least in those first few hours there. And the weather sort of gives the Germans a bit of an advantage. So give us an idea about what had been happening kind of as the end of November comes along, because some of these Allied units have been fighting all the way from Normandy. They're, 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 they've been on the, the front line a long time. They're, I mean, Brad from the On This Day in Canadian Military History would make the point the Canadian units particularly have had almost no breaks since Normandy. Some of the British units, everyone's kind of just a bit worn out, aren't they? So, so, that's the, so give us an idea of what the line, what were the Allies going into the winter expecting to happen? Okay, I mean, you know, my, my main thrust tonight to everybody is the bulge is not what you expect yeah. um it the, the the common picture that's been played out um whether through documentaries films or a lot of other books is just just disappears when when you begin to prod and look at the the, the situation in, in detail um the the Allies are expecting the Germans to crumble that's why we launched Operation Market Garden got a rude surprise um but again, uh, you know, all the evidence is that the Germans aren't able to go over to the offensive anymore. They've lost too much in terms of manpower and, and equipment. And what they do have is on the Eastern Front. Um, so we're expecting a, an easy, quiet winter because the main German effort is obviously going to be to defend the River Rhine. So yeah. why would they come forward of that when they need to husband all their resources uh, and keep the Allies out of Germany. And of course, what the Allies are obviously going to do is cross the River Rhine in probably December or January 1945, uh, and that's when all these German units um, will be needed. Um, so the idea of them coming to attack the Allies um, is, is, is ludicrous, because you know, for two reasons. Our mindset says Christmas, you know, the Germans haven't got the will to do this, and haven't got the capability. Uh, and this is the, the least um, suitable time of year to launch a major attack. Um, the other half of that is, is intelligence. Now, what does your intelligence picture give you? And we've got strategic intelligence, which has been very helpful throughout the Normandy campaign, Enigma, um, rather more opaque um, uh, after, after Market Garden. And we rely on it heavily. But the moment the Germans retreat back across their own frontiers, they don't need to use Enigma because they can use officers in cars and on motorcycles delivering, hand-delivering messages. They can use their own secure telephone system. Mm -hmm. So all of a sudden, our intelligence picture dries up. Um, when we're operating in France and Belgium, we have friendly locals who will also tell us what's going on. But there are no friendly locals in Germany really to do that. So our strategic intelligence dries up. Um, the prisoner of war picture, the aerial photo uh, photographs, 
um, and all those different sort of assets, uh, tactical signals, intercepts, they do indicate, uh, as do some Enigma uh, signals, that, that, that something untoward is stirring. But, but the, the key point about gathering information is how you turn it into intelligence, and you turn it into intelligence when you collate it. And what the RAs aren't doing is collating all that material. Um, and the big, big problem here is that our mindset is that the Germans won't go over to the offensive. And so we make the intelligence fit that picture. It yeah. should be the other way around. The intelligence is indicating this. Therefore, um, how can we interrogate that and, and, and conclude, make our own assessments? But everybody, right from the, the top, Eisenhower, Kenneth Strong, his chief of uh, intelligence, goes with the idea that you know it's going to be a fairly sort of easy easy christmas and afterwards of course the intelligence community whitewash themselves so that they're not seen to be to to be to blame it's not just an intelligence uh, failure um but it is it, it, it you know one of the reason for surprise it is largely intelligence led and we do this time after time every army does it they get into a mindset uh, and the Arab-Israeli wars are, you know, very good, more recent examples uh, of where you're convinced that something is going to happen. Uh, and the, the the warning signs you get from intelligence are misinterpreted or ignored. And that's what we've got with the bulge here in, in uh, late 1944. I mean, and ironically and paradoxically, Peter, we've, we've relied on the Germans doing that very same thing when we planned Operation Overlord. We've relied on them having a confirmation bias about where the landing is going to be as essential to how the Operation Overlord actually unfolded. Basically, for those who are watching this who want to be reminded, you know, we know that by going to Normandy, it's not the obvious place. Germans are going to automatically going to assume we're going to the Pas de Calais. And by going somewhere different, Normandy as different, where the Germans are keep on believing that, well, of course, they're going to go to Padakale because it's logical. So now in the winter of 44, the Allies are thinking, well, of course, it's going to go to a static campaign over the winter because that's what we're expecting. So we've, we've fallen for the same thing they fell for, really. I, I, this is why I find the Bulge campaign so fascinating, because there's a takeaway for anyone of um, any military discipline. Um, the, the, the way it, the campaign magnifies um, all the flaws in, in the Allied army and, and the German army as well. Um, and, it, of course, it's also the biggest battle the Americans fight in, in Europe in the Second World War. Yeah. There are far more units involved than there ever are in Normandy. Um, and I always argue that the test of an army, the true test, is when things are going badly. Uh, and we can talk about Normandy till the cows come home. But essentially, you know, D-Day and, and a lot of the operations are intensively planned, um, backed by massive resources. And we know in advance largely what's going to happen. And, um, and we, you know, and, and it does play out that way. Um, the bulge is, is full of uncertainties. Uh, and if an army is caught off balance by the unexpected and then fights back and manages to win in the end, surely that's the true test of a, a good army um, that's been well trained uh, and has the proper equipment rather than you know everything going well for most of the time which is what we see in normandy and for most of the rest of the war so this is the real test this is this is when men and plans and equipment are all tested and not found to be wanting and and do you think peter generally that the perception of the bold is too much on it being a german offensive as opposed to what you're saying there a magnifying of the allies uh, complacency, whatever other adjectives you want to use to describe the situation there. And we're, we're, we're looking at it as what the Germans achieve as opposed to what the Allies had allowed, the situation the Allies had allowed themselves to get in. Well, I, I think, um, I mean, all the historiography, all the writing about the bulge is about the first few days. And yeah. I got sucked into that because they are, you know, absolutely fascinating. Um, so the Germans attack on the 16th of December. Um, you know, when does the Battle of the Bulge end? Uh, and I, you know, I, I write about that in, in, uh, in, in some of the chapters. It's difficult to say. I mean, the fighting is pretty much decided by the end of the month, the direction of the, of the battle. Um, the Germans pull out technically or, or pull their panzers out on the 16th of January. 
um, and the U.S. Army deems the bulge to be over on the 28th of January. So it's about a month, but but sometimes you can argue it's a month and a half. Um, so you've got a campaign that goes on for, you know, arguably a month and a half. And yet all the books, and, you know, I'm just as much to blame, concentrate really on the first 10 days because they are, you know, so fascinating. Um, but, you know, there's really hard, difficult fighting um, in mid-January. I mean, what happens weather-wise is the weather is appalling for the first few days. Um, the sun comes out, the snow melts, um, and the, the weather is relatively pleasant uh, on Christmas Day, Boxing Day, and for the, ne the next few days. Uh, and then at the beginning of January, the temperatures plunge all over again, and it becomes even more miserable. Um, and that's, you know, just as important, just as bitter fighting. Um, and by then, the Third Army is coming up from the south, uh, and uh, Montgomery is commanding the the, the northern uh, um, group, uh, which includes seven corps uh, under Collins, but also thirty corps under uh, under Brian Horrocks, the, mm. the small, much much smaller British contribution. Now they're really important aspects of the battle, but they're really in they're easily overlooked because we get obsessed by the you know the first ten days, two weeks uh, of, of the Battle of the Bulge, and there's so much more to it. Um, and you get pieces of terrain and small towns and villages that are fought over several times yeah. over the course of six weeks. And I think that's also the, the, the fact that it overlaps several countries, as you said there, Luxembourg, Belgium, even kind of into France and Germany, really, is that we the, and, and so many units over such a large space is that taking it all on board as one large operation is, is inherently difficult. So we focus on one aspect of it. Um, and, and it means we're lo leaving the others out at our kind of uh, failure to understand. But generally speaking, this idea about being obsessed about the first few days of a battle applies to everything, doesn't it? It's Normandy is the same. Iwo Jima is the same. We that, I think, is generally where history is guilty of. Is We're always focused on that first exciting bit and then lose interest a few days in. But you're going to come back on in January and explain uh, and talk about the conclusions and the aftermath and things like that. But people have asked you because you're on where you, essentially where you think which of the thrusts which of the key uh, movements the germans make is where you think it all started unraveling northern shoulder southern shoulder baston what's your what would be your first response to that question where it all went wrong okay so there were, th there were three armies the sixth in the north in, in the, what we call the northern shoulder um in the middle we've got the fifth panzer army under von van teufel uh, and in the south um, we've got the Seventh Army under Eric Brandenberger, and there they have no tanks, and their job is to absorb um, the counterattack that they all expect, Hitler included, that Patton will make coming in from the south. How you do that without any tanks is is beyond me, but that, you know that was the general that was the general plan. So is it the centre or or the north? Well, the north is massively reinforced. The 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 uh, the two SS Panzer divisions there, the first and the um, uh, the twelfth SS, the Hitler Jugend. Um, uh, the, in, in the Panzer armies um, get the best I equipment, um, but they get the most unsuitable terrain, really, really difficult terrain up on the northern shoulder. Uh, and the whole time thing, the clock ticking away, um, surprise is the biggest weapon the Germans have, and that runs out after about 48 hours. So really it's how far you can get in 48 hours. And the Germans, the 6th SS Panzer army up in the north, um, they have the most difficult terrain. They really grind to a halt incredibly quickly because the terrain just doesn't work for them. Um, and so that unravels. Um, the centre, Manteuffel um, goes, gets much further. He has three panzer divisions uh, in the advance. He's a clever general. He understands terrain much better than the SS. He has better trained, motivated troops, and he's just... A, a much much better commander i think had he re had the resources the sixth ss had had um he would have got much further but of course none of this is going to make any difference because the river Meuse is is you know the, the first hurdle you've got to reach and no one really gets beyond it um not even uh the, the man teufel's lot because they run out of fuel Mm -hmm. um, and sooner or later, I mean, this whole gamble of not you, of not having the Allied air forces, sooner or later, the snow is going to disappear, the clouds are going to, to move, uh, and the sun is going to come out, and then Allied air is going to happen. So, you know, one of my arguments is, suppose it succeeds, suppose they get all the way to Antwerp, 
um, and you have this long German corridor, 120 miles long, of German armour that's going backwards and forwards, reinforcing their success at, at Antwerp. Sooner or later, that's just going to be closed down by Allied air forces. Um, and the, there's a real parallel here with Arnhem. Uh, yeah. Arnhem is, a, is, is very similar. It, it, it's an armoured thrust by the Allies uh, along three points, obviously Nijmegen, Eindhoven to Arnhem. Um, and if the Allies can't get to Arnhem controlling the skies with all the resources and fuel and aircraft that they've got in September 1944, how are the Germans going to be able to do double the distance in the middle of winter with no uh, favourability in terms of resources, fuel, uh, or, or, or anything else, of course they're not going to be able to, which is why it's pie in the sky. But I think in, in, in you know if we look at the progress, Fifth Panzer Army makes much much better progress, and they are less well equipped than the Six SS Panzer Army to the north. Um, so you know, and, and that's a reflection on on the commander. Um, yeah. The terrain is also easier, I have to say, um, but Manteuffel you know deals with it much much better. But of course, right in the middle of that is Bastogne. Uh, and that, that's the town that throws the grit into this German yeah. machine that eventually slows down, partly because of Bastogne. And we had a couple of questions about, bo about uh, both Bastogne and also the fact it now has become the focal point for commemorations and perhaps places like San Vith should be maybe more thought about. And some two people have asked you to comment on, have you read Steve Zaloga's book about smashing Hitler's panzers about the northern shoulder? Because his conclusion is that is where... You know the, the Ardennes campaign that basically runs out of of everything. So a couple of questions there is: um, Are we maybe focusing too much on Bastogne? And what do you think about Steve Zaloga's book? Have you read Steve Zaloga's book? Steve's a good mate. We 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 spoke a lot about Normandy um, for the seventy fifth commemorations, uh, and he and I see eye to eye on many things, uh, and we'd certainly see eye to eye on this. Um, where the six SS uh, army unravelled was on the Elsenborn Ridge. Um, uh, and that is, you know, the highest bit of ground in the Ardennes. You've got to get up onto it to, to move beyond uh, and get to uh, to Brussels or indeed to, to, to Antwerp. Um, and that's why the parachute drop of uh, Von der Heydt is meant to come down on the Elsenborn Ridge. Well, you know, that gets dissipated. They get dropped all over the place. Um, but um, the, the forests uh, that... Um, uh, the, the Sixth Army have to get through to get up onto the Elsenborn Ridge are full of people like the Second Division, Second U.S. Division, um, uh, and uh, with Charles MacDonald, who, who writes his company commander, personal memoir, yeah. of slowing the Germans down. Um, and that's where it, it begins to unravel. And it takes the Germans so long just to wade through those, these uh, forest tracks that, that Sepp Dietrich complains about. But by the time they're through to Elsenborn, um, the the American the surprise has been lost. The Americans withdraw up onto the Elsenborn Ridge. They draw in huge numbers of uh, battalions of artillery, uh, and wherever the Germans try to manoeuvre, uh, it's, it's within range of American artillery. And there are something like twenty, uh, but more than that, battalions of every division's artillery, the core artillery, everything else, up there on the ridge, all, all sorts of different kinds of guns. And they're simply directed in massive shoots to yeah. wherever the Germans are trying to manoeuvre. Uh, and they, they, they simply can't get past it. So the Germans run out of time very quickly. Uh, and the battle is decided, in my view, and Steve's, up on the Elsenborn Ridge. But you contrast that with Bastogne. Uh, and what have you got on the Elsenborn Ridge? Uh, a windswept... Uh, bare our sort of piece of terrain full of guns that are just firing. Bastogne is a town that's besieged. Um, there are aerial drops, there are gliders, there are you know, sieges, there's the surrender demand by the Corps commander, General von Lutwitz, with his, his monocle and the reply of nuts, and you know, a lot of accounts written by um, parachute troops, 101st Airborne, obviously. Um, and the the Elsenborn veterans, when they were alive, used to get really angry about the attention mm. devoted to Bastogne, whereas not only they fought, uh, and that was almost ignored, but largely, you know, as, as I've just argued, um, the battle was decided up there rather than at Bastogne, but it had got everything, and, and then you've got Patton coming in and breaking yeah, the siege yeah. on 
Boxing Day and everything else. So, you know, that's partly the historiography. Um, and, and poor old St. Viet, um, the other town. I mean, the, in terms of nodal points where all the, the roads and railway network in, in, in the region run into, St. Viet is one and, and Bastogne is the other. And you've really got to hold both. Um, the, uh, the Americans do a very, very good job in, in, in terms of St. Viet. They, they pretty much sacrifice the, the Golden Lions division in, in holding it. But Manteuffel is held there for 10 days. Uh, and in his plan, he's got to get past it in uh, less than two days, in 48 hours. Uh, and he realizes on the third day, when he's still battling his way through and into and around St. Viet, that, um, uh, that his, you know, the plan is dead because he, he simply hasn't advanced nearly as far, fast and far uh, as he needs to be. So, yes, I mean, you know, our, our takeaway, if, if the, you scrape the gloss off our understanding of the battle is is far far different um, mm. to the glamour of the the current celebration. But you know that's where it happens. Yeah, um, it's interesting to reflect that that you know before long before the battle, Bastogne had a nuts festival, uh, and it, it, it was a Christmas festival because that's what you took off the trees at Christmas time. Yeah, and that goes back to medieval days, and it's been rehashed into you know throwing the nuts because um, that, uh, that's that's uh, that that was the response. Uh, that Anthony, Anthony McAuliffe gave to the German commander uh, surrounding uh, Bastogne. But at yeah. no point did those surrounding the, the garrison in Bastogne ever outnumber those inside. So it wasn't really a proper siege. And we can't really blame the people of that town for, for, for making something of that event because we've seen that in Normandy. We've seen other places. If you happen to be the first town to, to, to have a celebration or invite veterans back and you become the focus, then, well, so be it. That's how it goes. But I'm condensing a few questions. We've had several people asking. I'm going to condense it into one question. Um, if you were the German OKW in the full, uh, November, December 1944, is there anything else they could have done that was I – mean, obviously, this is inherently flawed, this plan. If you were there, was there something else they could, they could have done that would have drawn out the war or put the Allies in a position where they would sue for peace? Is there anything they can do? Someone mentioned Modal surrounding the U.S. First Army. Is there, is there, any, is there another roll of the dice they could do that you think would be better? OK, so if we remove the constraint of, you know, if you stray, you do anything to uh, even uh, disagree with Hitler, you're likely to have your head chopped off. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's uh, let's if we remove you, all of that, what, 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 yeah. friend, and he lets you have a free hand here. So you've, we'll, we'll give you that benefit of the doubt. He loves you. He thinks you're great. OK, <laughs> OK, so I need a monocle to respond to this question. But it, essentially, um, this is what the German high command do. They come up with two options. One is to go down Hitler's route and have a big solution which is what we've got here. Um, they, they spend a lot of time uh, and effort with maps and, and diagrams coming up with what they call a small solution. Uh, and that is to uh, encircle a lot of the American First Army, which is um, further north in and around the Arkan sector. Remember, there's an ongoing battle, uh, which is not really wound down until the beginning of the bulge um, for the Hurtigan Forest. Yeah. Um, and that has proved really um, bloodletting for the Americans, and they've never really quite uh, sort of solved the problem uh, of how to um, penetrate successfully the Siegfried line running through the Hurtigen Forest um, in and around Aachen. Um, and the Germans come up with a uh, German high command, Yodel particularly, uh, is pushing a plan which he calls the, the small solution, um, which is essentially to surround the whole area um, and using surprise and, and the fact that the Americans have really been shredded in that area, um, that would have had a, certainly a better chance of succeeding um, than the bulge uh, eventually did. Um, now, of course, they would have had to relinquish it sooner or later. So the, this is never going to be a strategic solution. But if you want a, an operational blow that will knock um, the, uh, the allies back, um, then probably that terrain is more friendly towards the Germans than uh, the Ardennes region was, because you know the, the Germans in that sector, up up, up in Arc and, and, and a bit further north, uh, would have yes, they'd have had surprise on their side, uh, but they'd have they'd have had much easier going in terms of terrain. And of course, they 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 would have known it much better. Um, so they could have done probably more damage uh, to the Allies there in terms of perhaps taking prisoners, killing, wounding, uh, and uh, destroying equipment. But the end result would have been the same. 
Yeah, I mean, they're, they're not going to at this point. I mean, there's, there's there's always these rumors going around of the Germans sending couriers across to sue for peace and to, to do a deal. And I, with all the due respect to people who kind of put those theories out there, none of them are going to really work by now, are they? I mean, we, by this stage, it's too late in the game. Churchill, FDR have decided they want unconditional surrender. No, nothing's going to really sway the Allies from from their to use an American term, their end game of of getting to Berlin and defeating. So it's all just pie in the sky for the Germans, really, isn't it? I suppose. Well, I mean, there are a couple of points here. Um, both sides are now polarized. Um, the as you say, the Allies have come up with unconditional surrender, and they absolutely believe in this. You know, this is the only way that um, they are going to. Uh, and they come up with this really to to mollify Stalin. Um, because they realise that you can do a lot of damage to Germany either from the east or the west, but you need to coordinate your activities. And the only really way that you're going to be able to do that is is unconditional surrender, because Stalin is so uh, suspicious that the Germans will do a deal with the uh, the Western allies or vice versa. Um, so the moment you iterate on paper, and this is probably in res- retrospect the naivety of Roosevelt, that the, the Russians you could do a deal with and they're really quite nice and honourable mm. people. Um, sorry, the Russians are, the Soviets aren't. That's what I mean. Yeah. yeah, um, yeah. Uh, that, so that, that's why we come up with uh, unconditional surrender. But we never get in the war how controlling Hitler is. I mean, the Arden offensive is known as the Rundstedt offensive, and he's seen and understood to be the driver behind it. He objects to it violently. I mean, the only reason why it happens is is Adolf Hitler personally. And we never understand just how much he controls every aspect of yeah. civilian and military life in Germany. We, 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 we now know we take it for granted. So all these counterfactuals of could we have done this? What about peace feelers? I mean, no one is going to put out peace feelers if Hitler has anything to do with it. And the moment you do, you're going to get absolutely slaughtered. I mean, look at what happens in 1945 when, when Goering and Himmler um, are both found to be putting out peace feelers. I mean, Hitler orders their arrest and execution. And, you know, these are his loyal henchmen. And this is days before the end of the war. So it, this is so unlikely. Um, no one after the 20th of July, um, when Hitler takes the opportunity to execute about 5,000, of of anyone in in the hierarchy, military or civilian within Germany, um, that he just doesn't like on a whim. Um, never mind, you know, those actively involved in the plot. Um, you know, peace feelers are not going to be accepted by the Allies because of unconditional surrender, uh, and they're not going to be tolerated by the Germans because they're so much under the thumb. Um, if you look at the the SD and the Gestapo reports, I mean, there's huge manpower there just monitoring internal dissent, looking at people's yeah. mail, accepting you know reports of, of of traitors within the Reich. So I mean, this you know, I don't really go very far down down the route of looking at, at the counterfactuals because they're just so unrealistic. Um, and, and you know, you are you're going to have the weight full weight of the Nazi um, regime come down on you like a ton of bricks if you're even remotely considered to be you know disloyal and that's where i think where if you're if we take the normandy campaign and the ardennes offensive as as two separate campaigns which of course they are that when you're writing about the ardennes you have to have a lot more layers of this for want of a better phrase political intrigue going on behind because we are talking as you've said several times we're talking post assassination te- attempt and and i think you have to divide the way the german high command functions into before that event and after that event and and of course the ardennes comes firmly after that event and so as your book does, you have to layer in some of that thinking and what's happening and the fear and the way the German officers are frankly out to protect their own skins. And and as as also the end of the war is looming, they're worried about potential war crimes trials. They're worried about the, the skeletons in their cupboards of things they've done earlier. And so with that in mind, you know, you've written an incredibly brilliant book about the uh, about D Day. You've written now a, a book about the Ardennes. You're now talking about the last hundred years of the of hundred days of the war coming up. Are, where are we in our understanding in terms of historiography of the Ardennes? There's still lots more work to do to put it into context, or you know, because I like the way the way you interact with people on Twitter. You you definitely see that your books are not the final word. You 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 kind of you're there to inspire people. To, so in ten years' time, someone else will come out with a book that will 
agree with some of your points, challenge your points and take things further forward. So do, do you think we are we need to do more work into the Ardennes in terms of that to get to fully grips with what it all means? Well, I always like to pay tribute to my um, mentor, academic, military and, and historical, um, who really you know put me where I am today. And that's Professor Richard Holmes, yeah. um, who is both my professor and, and my brigadier as director of reserve forces in the United Kingdom. Uh, and some of you may have seen on Twitter today that there's going to be a, a library um, uh, uh, opened in his name at, at, um, at Sandhurst. Um, now, you know, Richard taught me, uh, and I would fully agree with this, that, that um, you, when you write a book, that's, that's your contribution that will stand for a few years until it's bettered by someone else. Uh, and he knew a lot of historians who felt that their word was sacred, uh, and once they'd written their book, that should that should be there forever and, and and not really be questioned. And all we're doing is we're adding a piece to the jigsaw, which may be uh, replaced by another piece um, when someone looks at the jigsaw as a whole in a different way. Or it may be, you know, it may stand for a while. So I've I've put my jigsaw puzzle piece in, and I've tried to look at it in different ways. So you're very kind to talk about you know the first third of my book really, which is not about combat but about the personalities and yeah. the dysfunctional way um, that the Third Reich operated under Hitler. And you know people in book reviews are sort of say, oh god, you know forget the first third because there's no shooting, there's no war, there's no combat. But I would argue you can't understand the way the campaign unf unfolds uh, unless you have a look at that. So what I, I think my contribution is partly looking backwards uh, at, at how the, the campaign, w where the seeds were uh, and why it happens. Um, and it isn't a German army initiative. It's Hitler's and Hitler's alone. Take Hitler yeah. out of the equation. There wouldn't have been an Ardennes campaign. Um, uh, and, and the reason why there is is because he is so controlling. Um, yeah. But but you know why why the Ardennes? Well, you know this these odd these odd things in the OKW war diaries that go back to July 1944. I mean, even while Normandy is happening, as we we, we began um, tonight's podcast. Um, but more more to the point, you know what's going on in Hitler's mind? Well, he's completely obsessed by Wagner, um, and the first German warrior, uh, who's a guy called Arminius, uh, who is taught by the Romans their tactics. Uh, then goes back to his tribe, turns tail on the Romans and attacks them in a forest, the Teutoburger Wald. Um, and, and Hitler is obsessed with this guy. There's a tapestry, the only one commissioned that, that, that's actually completed, that goes up in the, in, in, uh, in the Reich's Chancellery of Arminius. The, and he's regarded as the first German warrior. Uh, and this is where I argue the idea of uh, going into the woods dressed as Americans mm. comes from. This is, you know, the first German warrior who, and, and this crops up in Hitler's table talk, if you if, if you read the relevant sort of memoirs and, and, and volumes on it. You know, Hitler, Hitler loves this, this, this guy. It's the equivalent in 1944 of doing what this guy did. This is this is the destruction of Varus's legions um, in the early years of the, the Roman ventures across the Rhine. The equivalent, 1944, is a of, of copying American tactics putting on their uniforms uh, and, and going back against the Americans. This is the fire breathing dragon that you might find in a, uh, a, a Wagnerian opera. So understanding Hitler's psychological makeup, I argued, and you know, there's, a, I've had a lot of pushback. That's fine. This is my argument. Um, understanding Hitler's makeup does help you understand why this operation is launched, where it yeah. is from the woods when it is in in, uh, in in a hospitable climate and gives you an insight as to why some of the tactics that are used, why have the Germans never used, you know, yeah, wearing yeah, allied yeah. uniforms before? It's where all of this comes from. So there's a lot there in the, in the book that was fun to write, fun to research, that's innovative and new. You can, you know, you can push back, you can ignore it, get stuck into the combat if you want. But I think this is, you know, an aspect that we've overlooked. And the other, the other side, the other point I, I really look at we haven't discussed it is that of course hitler is is uh, is is a druggie by the end yeah. of 1944 he's you know he's he's fed small amounts of cocaine every day he has different doctors who prescribe different things which you know conflict with each other uh, and hitler the hitler of 1944 after the bomb plot is not the hitler of 1940 he's yeah. not making rational decisions anymore 
Um, it's a, it's a very, very, very big change over four years, isn't it? Yeah. It, the, the, yeah. The, even even in four, even from the beginning of 44, the end of 44, there's a massive great change in Hitler's just outlook, just, just the way he sets about his day. But then, you, know, you make that point there about going back to Roman history is whenever you start a book or a podcast or anything about an aspect of World War II is what do you, where do you start? You know, where, how much background do you give before you launch into the exciting thing? Because, you know, as you said on Twitter today, you know, this is three days before the launch of the, of the Ardennes Offensive. And actually, the Ardennes Offensive goes back to 1940 and it goes back to the ideology in Hitler's head from, from 2000 years ago. This is, this is what makes it so inherently fascinating. But we will let people go because the We Have Ways podcast is starting with doing the live show of. Of, of episode nine of Band of Brothers. So we'll let people tear off to do that. So, Peter, you are going to come back in January and do a recap of, of where the Allies are yeah. at yeah. the end of the Ardennes, and then that will lead nicely into your next book. So we'll come back for that. So, folks, um, I will let you all go off and watch the We Have Ways um, episode nine of Band of Brothers. And thank you for watching tonight. Thank you for bearing with us during the initial gremlins at the beginning there. Yeah, my apologies for the, the, the technical problems, but I'm, I'm glad we've managed to fight our it's way through. And, and if I can just say, you know, happy Christmas to everybody. Yep, indeed. And I will see you in the new year, Peter. So thanks, everybody. This is Paul Willett for World War II TV saying I'll see you all again on Wednesday. Cheers, everybody. Bye.